And now a look at Robotech Crisis Point, the second Robotech card game released by Solar Flare Games set during the Robotech Masters time period. First off, big thanks to Solar Flare Games for sending us a copy of this game. A Robotech Crisis Point was designed by Dave Killingsworth, featured artwork from Andorra Sidonia, Andrew Kramer, and Juan Lopez. It was published in 2019 by Solar Flare Games. Crisis Point is a two-player competitive card game featuring the Robotech Masters era of Robotech. This was the second series in the Robotech franchise, uh, both for the original series and for this game collection. Now, this game is a follow-up to Robotech Force of Arms, released by Solar Flare the year previous, so uh, 2018. This game recreates a ground battle between the Invid Army and the Army of the Southern Cross. Now, while it borrows a lot of the basic mechanics from Force of Arms, it does expand on and improve many of them. Now, if you haven't already done so, I do suggest checking out my review of Force of Arms, though I will be repeating the basic mechanics here in this review for those of you who can't find the time. Now, before we get into those mechanics, I also want to point people to our Robotech Crisis Point unboxing video on YouTube. It's a great way to see what you get in the box for Crisis Point. Now, the first thing you'll note if you do know both games is this is a much bigger game than Force of Arms. And that's in many ways, not just physically. For one, the box is just bigger. This also includes a four-panel game board. Now, this is just a grid to place cards on, but it does help you organize the card and does feature some great Robotech Masters artwork. Now, like Force of Arms, this game does include mostly cards. Now, these are of good quality. Uh, they don't have quite the same finish as the original game, which does make the cards a little bit more vulnerable. But I do like the fact they don't re reflect light as much, which actually makes them more useful and easier to play, especially in my basement with the pot lights. Now, on Crisis Point, in Crisis Point, um, each side has their own deck made up of unit cards, combat cards, a base, command cards, hero cards, and end game scoring cards. In addition to that, there is a shared neutral deck of strategic locations. All of these feature excellent Robotech artwork and iconography. Now, along with the cards, there are two punch boards with a really high number of counters for each side. These include battle tokens, victory tokens, and then for each side, there are two specific unit tokens that are tied to specific cards. So four special tokens as well. And all of these are generally the same solid quality we saw from the previous game in the series, I expect? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's pretty much as good. They don't quite have that same linen finish, which I know does make the cards a little bit better. But again, that not having that made them actually easier to see well out on the board. So it, it's a compromise one way for playability, and I think I'd rather have that replayability. Also in this game, there's no you don't randomize your cards. You're choosing what to play. So by reducing that quality, even if your cards get banged up, it doesn't hurt anything. There's no random draw in this card, except for determining who's start player. Now, a game of Crisis Point starts off with a blank board. Now, the board has a 4x4 four four grid on it with the spots of, at the end of each rolling column where you're going to be placing combat cards. The middle is called the battlefield. Players are going to look at their hand of objective cards and pick two to keep in use for that game. So you're picking two endgame objectives. You're then dealt four random strategic location cards out of the deck. Players can then take their command and hero cards and put them aside because you don't need them until the second part of the game. Starting with the first player, determined by a random draw of combat cards, as I just mentioned, players will do the following steps in order. The first thing they're going to do is place a unit, base, or strategic location card onto the battlefield. Now, all players start with eight units, one base, and four strategic locations. By the end of the game, though, they're only going to place five of those units, two of those locations, and their base. So you're not playing all your cards every game. When they play the card, you're going to activate it and you're going to collect battle tokens. So each card works a little different. Locations have text on them. You read off the text, you carry it out. Usually it's going to let you assign battle tokens from the pool of pool to cards already on the board. When you play your base, you're going to gain battle tokens into your personal pool that you can use later, and you get it based on the number of combat cards you have left, which I actually thought was a really cool mechanic. So the longer you wait to play your base, which is one of your most valuable parts on the board, the less tokens you earn. So if you get it out early, you get more tokens, which is kind of neat. Units are all mecha from the series. They generate more battle tokens and usually have some kind of special effect. Most of those effects in this are tied to where the card's placed. 
So you might get extra tokens if you place next to your own units, or you might get extra tokens for placing a tank next to a strategic location, or it might let you attack enemy units that are either adjacent or not adjacent and so on. Once you've then played something out to the battlefield, you're going to pick one of your eight combat cards and play that on the edge of the battlefield. Each player has an identical set mechanically, like they have different art, but they're mechanically the same, worth two to nine battle points. These cards are paced, placed face down, and once you get to the resolution phase, they're going to affect all cards in the row or column they're placed in. So placing these can be huge. Then you're going to take one battle token from your pool that you've earned and place it somewhere on the map. Now, very different from Force of Arms, these tokens count as plus one for your side. So if you play it on your unit, you're defending that unit. If you play it on an opponent's unit, you're attacking that unit. Play continues until the battle folds full and all combat cards have been placed. So, well, we still have a game that, so far at least, has a lot of resemblance to the first. It's clearly a far, far more robust game mm. with a focus on strategy over what was often, often randomness in the other, especially by the fact that you're not you know, starting with that pre assembled mm. uh fleet yes yeah there's a lot more control over what's happening in this game now there are still some random factors like that plus one to plus nine range that you're putting out those combat cards that's huge but the board's not going to shift every turn as it does in the other game now just like force of arms after the board's filled out we do have that token phase the difference here is you're going to have a lot of tokens Every unit you put out earns you these battle tokens. Now, every battle token's plus one. Again, depending on where you put it. If you put it on your own units, it's defense. If you put it on your opponent's units, it's attack. If you put it on neutral units, it's also attack. No one's defending those. So you, what this works is you have so many of these is you're going to place two, your opponent's going to place two, you're going to place two, your opponent's going to place two, and go back and forth. In addition, you may have earned special tokens. So four particular cards in the game generate special tokens, and those are also played during this phase. So without getting into details, I'll just, like, the Invid have a drop ship that lets them swap out one of their units on the board for a battleoid in their, or sorry, a bioroid in their hand. And the Southern Cross has, like, a missile launcher that's going to damage a friendly unit but do a bunch of damage to the other things around it. So there's just a couple special things that make the game a little more asymmetric. Once all battle tokens are spent, we then get to the combat, or sorry, the, um, the command phase, where players are going to play command cards or hero cards. They have a set of these at the start of the game. You're going to play two of each. You're going to play two command cards and two hero cards. Uh, again, this is almost identical to Force of Arms. These powers are very similar between the two factions, but not exact. Um, some are going to, most of these are going to add battle tokens one way or another. So you're either going to add units to your own units, or you're going to add them to your opponents, or you're going to add them to neutral spots, and so on. Or you're going to swap or move tokens that are already out there. So interestingly, one of the Sun of the Cross one was remove three of your tokens from anywhere on the board and stack them on one opponent enemy unit. So it was called coordinated effort, right? So that's the kind of things you have in this. Interestingly, Invid in this case are more defensive, where the Southern Cross is more offensive, which is the opposite of the RDF and the Zentradi in the first game. Once everyone's played all their tokens and everyone's played all their cards, you then enter the scoring phase. Flip over all the combat cards and do some math. So what you're going to do is you're going to start with any one card on the board, you're going to look at it, and you're going to add up the battle value for each faction. So this is going to include the combat cards in the row, common, row column for each faction. So your two cards and your opponent's two cards that you just, you know, cross them off. Then you're going to add up any battle tokens on the card. Now, what I strongly suggest, this is not in the rule book, and I don't know why it's not in there. Because you're just matching number for number, we just paired off the battle tokens. So for every one of my battle tokens on there, I removed one of Deanna's, and then you whatever's left is your actual map, right? You're just going to simplify the math, plus it declutters the board a lot. So I actually suggest doing that before doing all this math, because I don't see why you wouldn't. Like, it's just going to make it easier. In the end, whatever card has the highest battle total is going to put a scoring token on the card. Ties are rewarded to the owner of the card. Now, what's a little bit of a problem here is it doesn't tell you what to do here for a strategic location. Because every other card's owned, but those strategic locations are randomized at the beginning. So it doesn't tell you what happens in a tie here. Now, we went with whoever was dealt the card and played it on the board, counted as owning it. Though I could also see having it just stay as a... Um, a neutral spot and if you have a tie you leave it on the board which is actually a mechanic from force of arms but to be honest in the rules it doesn't say either way once all the battle 
field cards have been scored, you're then going to grab those objective cards I mentioned right at the very beginning of the game. Beginning of the game, you pick two of these. Or you're going to score the one worth the most points. And I actually really like this mechanic. I've, I've played many games where you pick an end game scoring card and you keep it, but you score both. I like that you only get to score the better of the two. So that's, that's a neat mechanic I had not seen before. Now, these include things like you took both bases or you own at least three strategic locations or you got the three of the four corners or you have a bunch in a row and so on. There's a bunch of these. They are identical, which is worth noting. They're the same for both factions. You then add up the victory point total of all the cards you captured as well as your victory point card and whoever has the most points wins. All right, so I, I can definitely see the steps where we've advanced here from the first game. Uh, mm. The level of strategy is way up compared to that yeah. first outing. Uh, and the complexity is ramped up in multiple ways. Yet, when you get down to it, uh, once that strategy uh, section is done, it's more or less the same game yeah. on a bigger board. Yeah, it's very similar. Like, I, I, you can tell once the evolution. And when I first checked this game out, the first thing I did is I went to Board Game Geek to go, were these released a year apart? And I think that's what happened was Force of Arms hit the market and they got feedback, right? Not that I see that feedback on Board Game Geek, but I have to assume they got some feedback. And then took that feedback and improved on the original game. Because this is very much an evolution of the gameplay and mechanics of Force of Arms. And I got to say, in most cases, it was all step forward. They were improvements. Like, overall, the game's just bigger and more involved. There's more going on, more decision points. And the number of decision points at every step, there are more of. Like every turn, you're not just playing a combat card. You're playing a unit or a base or a location. And then you got to pick a combat card. That Right there, you're adding four different branches compared to the original game where all you played were combat cards. And then you're also going from a 3x3 three three grid to a 4x4. Four four. And then you're filling that, right? One kind at a time. It's not randomized. You are choosing where to place your units on the battlefield. And you are strategically and tactically placing those. And that's a huge part of the game. And position matters more. Because there's very little in this compared to the other game. In the other game, every turn, card swap. In this one, there are like two command cards or two heroes that let you swap or reposition units, and that's it. So of your 16 cards, maybe a couple are going to move. And one thing I do want to note that we actually got wrong on our first play, so I think this is important to note, is adjacency in this game does count diagonally. So when you play down that battleoid and it says you get a command point for every adjacent unit, that actually counts diagonally as well. I didn't expect diagonals in a grid focus game. Usually when you're on a four by four grid, you don't tend to go to the corners. Yeah, normally you don't consider diagonally adjacent. Um, no. and, and I expect a lot of first time players will probably make that same mistake. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a, a bell hops while your first play of every game is going to be an extreme play. That was our extreme play in this game was we totally messed that up. And it was when reviewing the rules that I, that I noticed the problem after the fact. Now, while many things in Crisis Point expand on Force of Arms, right? More decisions, more things going on, bigger board. There are some things they did to simplify the game that actually made it much smoother and easier to play. The biggest one is the fact they ditched attack and defense. Everything's battle points. It's I put my token on, it counts for me, for one. It doesn't if it's on mine, it counts as defense. If it's on my opponents, it counts as attack. Done. You don't there's no trying to remember what you put where, trying to figure it out. All your combat cards just add more stuff. And then I, I like this. I think this was a great change. It's this is less fiddly, it's less math, it's less to worry about. All your numbers are dead simple, especially when you do that pair off when you remove a bunch. And another thing that's streamlined is you only get eight combat cards. So there's less math during the math phase at the end of the game. There's less variation because of it. Now, in the other game, you are going to add eight units to every fight. This time, you're only adding, adding two of your own, which is a big change from the last one. Or sorry, four. You're going to add eight total. You're going to, yeah. So the other game, you put two at each location, you add them up. So you have four per side. Here, you only have two per side. So I like that. It's, it's half the number of math and, and variation per row column. Yeah, and I'm sure that that uh, keeping track of the the attack defense difference um, was was problematic for enough people. I, I don't. I'm not surprised at all that 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 could be seen and as a you know sort of extraneous and just get pulled out in the yep. in the upgrade from game to game. Uh, while I can see someone might want the flexibility of that attack defense difference, if it encouraged extreme play, that's not helping your design. Yeah. 
And like, like it felt like the attack defense mattered more in the other, like you were making more decisions, but it was just, you're adding more numbers. Like it was just a harder number. Okay. My ship doesn't count for this fight because it's an attack ship and I'm using one of my own ships. So I'm obviously not going to attack. So that one doesn't count. And it was just, it was more fiddly where right. streamlining that was really appreciated. Now, I did note most things were improved, so I do have a couple of complaints about Crisis Point. The first is the amount of ambiguity in the rule book. This one does not was not as clearly written as the original, and there is at least one printing error. Now, in regards to the ambiguity, the most egregious problem was trying to find out where to get your battle tokens from, because the game comes with a ton of them. So clearly there's like a pool of them, right? And do you get them all? I'm going to play every one every game. That seems crazy. But then certain cards give you a number of tokens, which you don't put on anything. So you must have like your own pool, right? So you must have like a, a central resource pool that everyone can pull. Well, not everyone because they're color coded. And then you make your own. So you're like, all right, fine. So then I play the strategic location and it says, place one of your battle tokens on two adjacent cards. Well, where do those come from? Do I have to have them in my pool already? Or do those come from the central pool or the central supply? I'm assuming probably the central supply. I don't know. But then when you play a unit, now units are different than locations. That's a type of card. When you play a unit, every one of them has a number on it. And that's the number of tokens you get to take from the pool to your supply. And then that card, say like these are all different, but one specific card says, place a battle token. When played, place a battle token on a non-adjacent unit. Well, is that a token that I just earned by playing that unit, or does that come from the pool? Like I like I tried to Google this. I, I'm like, all right, this is bad enough. This is this is this is a pretty big mistake. Let's Google it. Unfortunately, this game, no one knows this game. This is a, a hidden gem in a way. This is a many people overlook this game. No one's seen it. No one's heard hold a heard of Solar Flare. I don't know what it is. Or no one's cared. I don't know. There's nothing. Like like I went on Board Game Geek. And there is literally not a single FAQ or rule discussion post on the, the entry, which is just rare. You don't tend to see that. So to get through your game, you and whoever you're playing with are going to have to sit down and decide these things because it's honestly not clear. And I'm still not sure what the right way is to use these counters. Yeah, well, well, Board Game Geek is a great resource. The smaller publishers like like this one, uh, don't get the full benefit because there aren't enough people playing the games to have questions or to know the answers to, mm -hmm. to, to fill it up there. So unless you get a little conversation started, there's no, no snowball to build up and get those mm -hmm. FAQs and things uh, rolling in the forums. Yeah, like we ended up deciding uh, after the first game to change it because originally we were only spending stuff in our personal pool. And while it gets to, because there's another rule that says every turn you place one token, well, you only get to do that if you want. It says if you can. So it has to mean you could get to a point where your pool's empty. Like there was just, it came up multiple times. So before you play the first time, just sit down with your opponent. I don't think this breaks the game. But depending on how you decide, it is going to change the feel of the game and how many tokens you generate, and thus how much impact those tokens are going to have on the game. Because if you generate lots of tokens, you're going to be able to counteract that plus nine combat card. Whereas if you're only generating a small amount, that plus nine combat card is going to win that whole row no matter what, right? So it's definitely worth talking about. Now, there is one obvious typo on one of the Southern Cross objective cards. This card gives you three points for capturing at least two opponent's batloids and if they only put one on the board you can still get two points the problem is the invid player doesn't have any batloids and we went through the entire deck to check what they have are bioroids now thankfully it's pretty obvious this card should say bioroids and not batloids but because of this every other card that said batloid and bioroids i don't even know if they're right or wrong so for example the invid player has a card that says get plus one uh get one token for every batloid you're next to well, is it supposed to be Batloid? Is it supposed to be Bioroid? Is it supposed to be if it's near attackers? Because that matters, because the one side has Batloids, the other has Bioroids. So I don't know if anything else, we played with rules as written, except for that card. So we just assume every other reference to Batloid and Batloid, Batloid and Bioroid were accurate. Heck, I can't even say them, so I can see how they made the mistake. <laughs> yeah, it, it's frustrating, but hopefully it's not really a deal breaker. It, it does seem at least... Like it was just that one typo. And thankfully, that one typo was on the obvious card where yes. you knew it had to be wrong. Yeah, it was obvious. Like partway through the game, our first game, I'm like, wait a minute, do you have any cards that say this? And and D's like, no, I don't have any cards that say that. I'm like, all right, I'm going to assume that it must mean this. 
Now, my other complaint about Robotech Crisis Point is the exact one I had for Force of Arms, and that's the fact that this is pretty much a math-heavy, abstract card game that doesn't really use the Robotech license all that well. Like, it does have the card art and the names and their well-known mecha, and you get all your characters from the series. Uh, there's not a lot here to make you feel like you're playing a ground battle between the Invid and the Southern Cross, except for those names. The fact that I have a card that says Dana Sterling on it just doesn't really make me feel like I'm playing Dana Sterling. Now, similar to the first game in the series, again, you could retheme this to be any two-sided battle, either historic or fantasy. So a level up from the original, but still ultimately a Nitzia tri tri tribute. Yeah, no, I agree. If it, it still feels like a Nitzia game. Now, overall, despite a few flaws, uh, Deanna and I really enjoyed this Robotech themed card game. Uh, like, I quite liked Force of Arms. She was a little more ambivalent on it. Uh, I, the first Robotech game from Solar Flares is a decent quick filler game. This takes all the good parts of that and improves on them. It's a much more involved and strategic game overall. Building the battlefield as you play, right? Pulling the cards out as you play has a lot of strategic and tactical elements and actually makes you feel like you're positioning things and have control over the battle. While the combat cards do still add a pretty random element, especially because they go from two to nine, uh, unit positioning and how you spend your tokens does have more of an impact. I also greatly appreciate how the scoring system was streamlined by getting rid of the whole attack defense thing and just switching to a generic battle value value the other thing great about this game is that you don't use your cards all your cards so force of arm every game is going to feel the same because you play the same battle cards every game you you play eight of them every time this time you're only gonna you're only selecting two secret objectives out of your pile you're only going to play five of your eight units you're only going to play you get randomly assigned locations and of those locations two are never in play and you're only going to play two of the four you got so not only are out of the well, whatever i don't do the math we each get four so there are 10 so out of the 10 only four are ever in play and out of those four no oh, sorry only eight are ever in play and out of the four you have you're only playing two whatever you only use some of your locations uh, this greatly increases the replayability of Crisis Point, especially when compared to Force of Arms. So we're, we're, we're definitely a little past the coffee shop game here on this one. Yeah. Uh, with space and, and, and complexity, at least. Time as well. Like you're looking at an hour to play here versus a, a half hour, 50 minutes to half hour. You're looking more at 45 minutes to an hour for this one. It's definitely a, a, a deeper, more involved game. Now, I, I found Force of Arms to be a fun distraction. It was neat. It was kind of cool. This is a good game. Like, this is solid. Uh, it builds on the Nitzia-like gridded math mechanics from Force of Arms and improves on them in many ways. It's a, both more tactical and strategic, and it feels more like your decisions matter and the randomness factors ramp down. Added to the fact you don't use all your cards every game makes it more variable, adding to its replayability. Now, there are some ambiguous ambiguities in the rule book and until there's an official faq or something out there i do suggest discussing these before you play the game they aren't game breaking and do note there is one card with a typo on it while i do recommend robotech fans check out force of arms and picking this up because you're robotech fans you're going to want this just because it's a robotech thing i think crisis point is going to be bigger than that i think it's going to appeal to abstract game fans with or without the robotech license there is a very solid game here. And to me, that nostalgic theme is an added bonus. Now that theme's not tied in well, I do enjoy playing with heroes and mecha I recognize and knowing what the two factions are. If you're looking for a solid Robotech hobby board game, so far, this is the best one I've played. It's engaging, replayable, and fun. If you enjoy math-baked games like the type Internet is famous for, well, this isn't one of his games, you may want to check this out. For anyone that's not a fan of abstract math-heavy games, you probably didn't make it this far into the review anyway, but if you did, this is probably going to be a skip for you. Unless, again, you're that huge Robotech fan and you just want to collect all things Robotech, then you might want this one for your shelf to show off. Be sure to also check out our re written reviews of both Robotech Force of Arms and Robotech Crisis Point by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Reviews.